Production funding for Flying Squirrels Insider is made possible in part by... Clean water is one of our most valuable resources. Conserving it should be all of our responsibility. Remember every day to make every drop count. Wash full loads, take shorter showers, turn off your faucet. Water, use it wisely. Let's commit to conserve. And by SciComm Technologies, celebrating 20 years in IT. SciComm is dedicated to helping customers stay on top of the tech wave, whatever comes next, online at SciComTech.com. Flying Squirrels Insider is heading your way. This week, the squirrels have turned things around with a sweep of the Fisher Cats and a solid road trip. Giants top prospect Christian Arroyo stops by the studio to discuss his solid first half of the year and shows us what it's like defensively to make that standout play it short. Also, the squirrels' community efforts this week revolve around mustaches. Sit down and strap in. FSI starts right now. Hello once again and welcome back to Flying Squirrels Insider. I'm your host Jay Burnham. The Flying Squirrels back in town this week and Richmond playing a much better brand of baseball. On the show this week we have the Giants number one prospect shortstop Christian Arroyo stopping by in just a bit. But first we'd like to remind you that Utility Buddy from the City of Richmond Department of Public Utilities makes us aware of Richmond's natural gas safety program. Getting ready to install a fence or put an addition on your house. Contractors, homeowners, and do-it-yourselfers, make sure you call 811 before you dig. As always, here on the show, if you want to win free stuff, text us, scratch off to win. Text FSI to 63975. Mobile marketing services provided by Optin Technologies. Message and data rates do indeed apply. With that said, I'll bring in my cohort here on the show, my broadcast partner, Greg Caserta. Greg, the Flying Squirrels playing a much better brand of baseball recently. Why? Well, I think they're out of the month of May. That's yeah. the most important thing. And last time we were here, we had some fun with Jay about his bold proclamation about no 15-game losing streak. That 14-game losing streak is in the rearview mirror. And as Jay said, a much better brand of baseball for the Squirrels. Starting pitching has kind of set the tone for them. Dan Slania has been a welcome addition to the rotation, and the transition for him has gone very well. So far, 2-0 in four starts, and it's kind of carried over into other areas of the team. I know that Austin Slater going up to Sacramento is a big hole and a big void, but Ryder Jones has filled in admirably in the three spot. Before we get to Slania, which We'll talk about here in a second. You mentioned Ryder Jones, and I think there was some panic for Squirrels yeah. fans because Austin Slater, who had been leading the league in hitting, was promoted to AAA, and rightfully so. In his stead, the Flying Squirrels need to pull to within. Ryder Jones filling in and filling in admirably. And I think we talked about this recently. Ryder Jones in San Jose last year, he was used as the three and four hitter at times, but numbers show that he was much better in the five or six spot, and that's where he was early on this season. Now as the number three hitter, he actually shows a little bit more power, and it gives you that lefty-lefty backup with or a pace of batting behind him in the four spot. So far, Jones has answered the call, and he's looked really strong doing it. And he celebrated his 22nd birthday in Manchester, New Hampshire, with a home run over the right field wall, came back the next day, and hit another home run. So Jones on the rise for the Flying Squirrels. Squirrels actually sweeping that series against the New Hampshire Fisher Cats. They're still in last place as we record this on Thursday, but it looks like they're clipping at the heels of fifth and fifth, fourth place. They certainly are, and the best part is that while this has been going on, the Squirrels have been gaining a lot of games in the division. The Akron Rubber Ducks, as of this taping, have lost 11 in a row. That's hard to believe. And now the gap is closing, and even though the Senators and the Curve are playing much better, the Squirrels are within striking distance, which is something that we could not say just a few weeks ago. Still a long way to go, but they're playing better baseball as we outline. And part of that reason is because the squirrels at the plate have been a bit more patient. Mm -hmm. And that begins with Ricky Oropesa, the squirrels last in the league in terms of drawing walks. But so far, the last three or four games, they've actually been able to see, see more pitches. Yeah, and you have to maximize what you're given. And I think for Oropesa early on, a lot of shifts on the right side of the infield. He's starting to see pitches off the plate more, and he's not chasing as much. And I think that's carried over to some of the other players in the lineup. The squirrels are not going to be a patient team all the time, but if they can do it selectively, like they did the other night against Binghamton, uh, they capitalized against the knuckleballer, Mickey Janice and eight walks was a season right. high for the squirrels carried them to an 8-1 win and uh, if you see that it uh, it's really helpful moving forward. 
And in that game, today's guest, Christian Arroyo, had a 10-game hitting streak to come to a close, but he walked four times to lead the Flying Squirrels that day. So the offense is starting to pick things up. You mentioned the pitching, which, by the way, has been one of the better staffs in the mm -hmm. Eastern League. Last taping here, we had special guest Tyler Beatty. He pitched that night, and boy, what a start it was for Beatty. And you and I were holding our breaths yeah. because we thought, Didn't okay, if he comes here and now he goes out that night and doesn't have a good start, who do you think gets blamed? It's the two radio mm -hmm. guys, obviously. He goes out, he throws eight innings. You're thinking, okay, maybe we've got to get guys in here more. Let's see what Christian Arroyo can do after his appearance here today. Beatty with a near no hitter. Flying Squirrels rotation getting an additional piece. You mentioned in the opener, Dan Slania, who we talked about on the last show, who's been a guest on this show as well. He's making that transition from the bullpen to the starting rotation, and he really hasn't missed a beat. Not at all, and it coincided with his 24th birthday. Steve Klein joked with him, here's your birthday present. You're moving into the rotation. We talked about it a couple of times, Chase Johnson going into the bullpen. Slania is 2-0 in four starts and as you said he simplified things fastball has slowed down a little bit to try and preserve his arm his curveball is suddenly becoming a weapon for him and uh, it's something that I think surprised a lot of people but he has answered the call and uh, it's a pretty nice addition at the back of that rotation some of the scouts telling us yeah you got a big guy 6'5 270 pounds throw strikes I'll take that guy any day of the week on my team now for the flying squirrels of course the goal is to get to the major leagues and there's been quite a few alum that have set that precedence at this level. And now we're starting to see some of the more recent squirrels make their major league debuts and being effective for San Francisco. We always hear about the homegrown infield. A lot of former squirrels making an impact in San Francisco. Mac Williamson hit his first big league home run. Turned out to be a game winner off David Price and the Red Sox. A shot in the eighth inning at AT&T Park. Uh, we saw Derek Law pick up his first major league save recently. And uh, Josh Osich has been a nice addition in the Giants bullpen and I think what it tells these current squirrels is that it can happen at any time and uh, tends to happen quicker for uh, for some and we've seen it. Those two guys were here last year. The two you mentioned Chris Stratton also was here for the Flying Squirrels. He picked up his first Major League victory. By the way, the San Francisco Giants, one of the best teams in Major League Baseball. Yeah, look out for San Francisco. They've gotten those contributions at the top of the rotation. Johnny Cueto, Jeff Samarja right now, two of the best signings of the offseason. And uh, you're starting to see Jake Peavy and Matt Cain piece things together. And the Giants have tended to play tight in the Western Division in the National League. They're starting to widen that gap a little bit over the Dodgers, and uh, it's been a lot of fun to watch. We would be remiss if we did not mention yet again closer Tyler Rogers. Rogers saved his 10th game last night. He saved 10 games and 10 opportunities. He leads the Eastern League in appearances. He has a 0.00 ERA, and he has now the longest stretch for a flying squirrels pitcher without allowing a run. And I believe it was Chris Heston Indeed. back in Hesto 2000. Presto. Hesto yeah. Presto. That's good. It goes with the tie. Hesto Presto. 2012, it was 20 and a third innings, I believe, for Heston. And Rogers has come in as a reliever, which is really hard to do because of the appearances that you're going to accumulate. And he's come in and hasn't missed a beat. And it seems like we talk about him every time we're here. And there's good reason why. All-Star game coming up in Akron later on this summer. I think Rogers, Arroyo, and some of the others will be there for the Flying Squirrels. Yeah, it's a, it's a shoo-in, I think, no. for a couple of guys, and uh, Arroyo we'll hear from in a little bit. He has been tremendous. Uh, he's had two 10-game hitting streaks very close together. You mentioned the four walks the other night and uh, playing a very good defensive shortstop and the occasional third base as well. Get the feeling we're bullish on this team. Thanks, Greg. You're very welcome. All right, Flying Squirrels. More Flying Squirrels Insider on the way for you here. It was May. The Flying Squirrels were growing mustaches for a good cause. Here's what it looked like at the Diamond. So in 2002, uh, some friends of mine grew mustaches for the month of November to raise money for local charities, and I thought it was hilarious. Uh, made a donation, and the following year, I joined the organization and realized that we didn't have a chapter started in Richmond, so I went ahead and established a Richmond chapter, recruited some guys, and we grew really ridiculous mustaches. and raised some money for local children's charities. Last year, our growing season, we had almost 200 growers and 
We raised $140,000 for local charities. Ask, Scan, Stop Child Abuse Now, the Children's Hospital here in Richmond, the Feed More organization, and the Autism Grant Group seem to really be a good match for us, and, and so we're going to continue to raise money on their behalf and have a good time doing it. So I started at the beginning of May, uh, cleaned it all up, and just let the let this let this thing grow. I've had the beard for a while now. Just wanted to go from there and just grew out the wings a little bit, so I could twist it up. It's grown on me a little bit slowly. I'm grooming it every morning when I wake up. You know, just getting it going down straight and everything, and trying to make it grow down here. The pros are it's awesome to have something this cool above my lip. It supports a great cause. I definitely feel more alert, stronger, more elusive. Keeps my face warm. People notice me more. I think it makes me look a little older than I am. My girlfriend loves it. I guess the, the cons are that when I first got the mustache, it always feels like there's food above your face. It was a lot itchier than I thought it would be. My girlfriend didn't like it. I often get mistaken as the first kid in middle school who grows his mustache, so that's, that's not great. My wife's not really thrilled about it. Whenever I talk to somebody, I can tell that they're looking at my mustache and not my, you know, my eyes or anything like that. I look completely like a creep. It's kind of creepy to little kids. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's no cons to the mustache, except when I lived in Chicago and you would breathe and it would freeze over. But uh, after I moved out of Chicago, there's no cons involved with mustache growing, all positives. My mustache idol's gotta be Mike Ditka. Nobody messes with Iron Mike. Now, obviously the classic mustache idols, your Burt Reynolds, your Tom Selleck. Working in baseball, you have to always look at guys like Raleigh Fingers and everything, so that mustache was pretty pretty intense. You know, I, I can't really curl it out or anything, but he, he did a pretty, pretty great job with that back then. Hats off to Raleigh Fingers. I mean, he kind of really, really took the mustache to a new level. Tom Selleck's just got a good, hearty, manly mustache, and that, that would be my mustache goal. Ron Burgundy, of course. I really like Marty Steele's. Um, he's been growing his for decades now, maybe even centuries, I don't know. Um, but he, he has a pretty good one, um, and it goes well with his tattoos. So, you know, it's, it's the most Richmond thing you can do. Maybe uh, some of the old time uh, ball players, Goose Gossage, Raleigh Fingers. Burt Reynolds is my favorite, you know, he's just cool all around. Baseball mustaches, Don Mattingly had a great one. He was, uh, he was my favorite baseball player when I was like, four years old. I'm a big fan of the movie Tombstone, so I'm gonna say the entire cast from that, especially Kurt Russell, Sam Elliott, and uh, Val Kilmer. Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec is probably my mustache idol. He's very, um, very, very thick and very symmetrical, so hopefully one day, if I do decide to keep this mustache, I'll look like that. Mustaches for Kids Richmond is a phenomenal organization. The guys over there are just awesome guys if you ever get a chance to meet them. It's nice to be able to do this uh, as part of uh, the effort to raise money for these organizations that benefit kids. It's always fun and for a month, you know, it's the least we can do. When your mustache is as thick and luscious as mine is, it's a lot of work, but it's for charity, so it's for a good cause. Come out and grow with us, www dot m4k richmond dot org guys looking very sharp with their may mustaches here we are back under the bright lights of fsi field i'm joined by giants top prospect christian arroyo and uh, christian top prospect is something that you've heard quite a bit about this season it means more responsibilities it means more interviews mm -hmm. is there ever a time where you say guys i'm just a regular 21 year old i'm trying to make it like everybody else I mean, I try to. Um, obviously, having that label as the top prospect, there's some things that you have to do. Interviews, that kind of stuff, sure. signing. Uh, but I, I enjoy it. Yeah. You know, it just kind of takes you away from reality for a little bit. Um, it's just cool. Like, there's some kids that they know your name and they know your number and they ask you to sign a ball for them and stuff. And it just kind of brings you back to when you were a kid and when you were doing the same thing. So. Uh, I think it's definitely surreal. I don't really try to get too caught up in it. I just try to act like one of the other guys, just like a normal kid. Um, just have fun, play the game hard. Is it a lot on your plate? You talk about the expectations that come with being the top prospect. Now you come into this league and it tends to be tough on hitters, plus you're playing your home games at the Diamond. Uh, but it seems like you've run with the opportunity and there really haven't been many lulls for you this season. You know, for me, I just try to, I just try to have fun. That's the yeah. biggest thing. Um, I don't really put pressure on myself. Um, it's just, I mean, there, there's enough pressure as it is uh, getting to the big leagues and being in double-A, playing in the diamond. I mean, it's a great field. Obviously, people know it's not the best hitter's field, mm -hmm. but, you know, 
it's easy to make excuses in this game, especially when you're not going well. So for me, I, I try not to make excuses. I just try to have fun and, and, and do the best I can to succeed and help the team win. Coming out of spring training, Bruce Bochy, probably one of the best, if not the best managers in baseball, talk very highly of you. Talked about how you made an impression, how you really ingratiated yourself with a lot of the veterans in that clubhouse. When you hear that, what's your first thought and how do you feel about it now? I mean, you know, going to big league camp for the second year was just another great opportunity for me. Um, after leaving my first camp, I knew there were still some things I needed to learn uh, becoming a professional baseball player. It's not just as clean cut as hitting and fielding and this. I mean, there's a lot of things that go on outside of the game. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to how you conduct yourself off the field, how you do your interviews. I mean, we have interview training. We've got all that kind of stuff. Um, how you handle yourself inside the clubhouse, especially when you've got guys who've been in the big leagues for 10, 11, 12, 13 years. Those guys expect the younger guys to, to act a certain way. So I had to learn really as a 19 and 20 year old how to act in a big league clubhouse. Mm -hmm. So for me, I kind of just sat down, just looked around and just kind of observed everyone, especially the, uh, the veteran guys and sure. just try to learn from them. So, uh, you know, I just try to stay quiet, even though during the season it's hard for me to because uh -huh. I like having fun with my, with my teammates and stuff. But uh, just try to stay quiet, mind my own business, learn, and just, just kind of stare in awe, I guess. I mean, obviously these are guys that you want to be your teammates one day, so you got to kind of get over the celebrity stage of, wow, you know, I'm in the presence of this guy or this guy. But uh, for me, it just, took, uh, it just took getting out there for the first warm-up or the first, uh, the first workout, the first game to just kind of loosen up and be myself again. He's Christian Arroyo, Giants' top prospect. Really appreciate the time, taking time out of your day to come out here. We'll be back right after this. We will go to Burnham's Morning Brew with special guest Steve LaRue on FSI right after this. I find when we're on the road, it can be hard to find like a good cup of coffee. It really is. Do you drink the hotel coffee? I try not to. I'll walk, I'll yeah. walk like, you know, I'll do a mile and a half round trip to get a good round trip though, not one right, way. Right, yeah. Right. Did you decide you wanted to be a catcher? I didn't start playing baseball until I was like nine. So I was way behind everybody else. I was originally in martial arts. Theoretically, if there was a brawl, <laughs> would your martial arts skills come into play? I mean, I've, you know, 14 years later, I've been in a few, but I don't, I don't think that they've, uh, I've ever had to use any of that. So who was your favorite player growing up? Favorite player was Matt Williams. My parents moved into a little duplex in Carson City, and on, they shared a duplex with Matt Williams and his family. We got cool sleeper buzz. If you played in the big leagues or up at AAA, you get preferential seating, right? You have to take care of the guys that play every day first, right. I think. That's how I, that's what I believe in. And the catchers. <laughs> so those are the guys that usually get the, the best. The, yeah, the, the preferential treatment, I guess, if that's what you want to call it on a 13 hour bus ride. All right, we're here on FSI Field, and we're going to go over with Christian Arroyo, one of the hardest plays to make as a shortstop, and that is the ball to your right, jumping throw over to first base, a play you've made a couple of times this season. When you see a ball off the bat hit to your right, what's the first thing you're looking at? There's a lot of things. Who's pitching, who's running, where the ball's going to be, and how I'm feeling that day. Some days I feel better than others. Sometimes my arm's feeling a little bit better. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a throw you're going to have to get a lot of oomph on when yeah. you're throwing it with your, yeah. with your right arm. So your steps are you got a ball to your right. You okay. need to do what? Take me through how you, how you actually physically so, you know, make the play. You get your preset about right here, and as the ball's coming, you're jumping, and as soon as you turn, you're going as low as you can to your right, and you're just going to cross over with this leg, get down to the ball as close as you can, and then jump and let it eat. So you're jumping off your uh, Usually <laughs> jumping off, trying to eat. jump off your right leg. Right. I mean, it's kind of it's hard to, for me, I like to, I like to get here, I mean, I, I, I jump off both, left or right. Yeah. Obviously, it's easier if you do left, but I get caught in the right sometimes where I'm kind of off balance, 
looks a little funky, but uh, I think the Jeter play he made with his left foot, which a little bit easier to get a little extra on As it. a shortstop, do they tell you that's the Jeter jump? That's the play. Yeah. It's the Jeter play. But yeah. the key there is that first move where you said yeah. you got to get low. Yeah, the, the, key, the key is is getting low and staying low. As soon as you come up, I mean, first off, it's hard to get up and then down and then back up again. So you just kind of want to make it as smooth as possible. And, and you're you saying know. if you have a slow runner and you got to go a ways to get the ball, you might take a moment to plant your feet, actually, yeah. as opposed to jumping and throw over to first base. Yeah, if i got a top of the order guy, a guy who's an outfitter that can run a little bit, yeah. that's when I'll kind of let it eat a little, little sooner. But when i got a catcher or something or someone I can kind of plant and get a good throw on, that's, you know, you'll slow down and then you'll take your time and try to make a good throw. It's been fun to watch. Well, thank you. Hopefully I make a few more of them. You got it. All right. Christian Arroyo joining us here on FSI Field. That'll do it for us on this week's show. We got a big one for you next time. Flying Squirrels Insider turns 50, and so does our Vice President, Todd Parney Parnell. We'll check in with him and our friends at Madarba to figure out how we keep him running for another 50 years. Also, the Squirrels will head to the carousel capital of the world, but we'll close with you today with a trip to Portland, Maine. On the road again with the Richmond Flying Squirrels as the Squirrels made their annual sojourn to northern New England last week. Three games in Manchester, New Hampshire and three games here at Hadlock Field in Portland, Maine. Now I'm standing outside this facility built in 1994. You can see the Portland Sea Dogs mascot right behind me. That's Slugger, by the way, as the Sea Dogs have been affiliated with the Boston Red Sox organization since 2003. And that affiliation very apparent to anybody who walks through these gates as the first thing you'll notice at this ballpark is what's called the main monster, a 37 foot high left field wall, a near exact replica to the green monster at Fenway Park. And of course, that is a park that all these players hope to one day play in. Our version of the green monster, we call it the main monster, and it's what we call a likeness of Fenway's green monster. It's not identical, but it is the uh, same height, 37 feet high. Uh, we are five feet further down the line, uh, 315 as opposed to 310 at Fenway. Uh, 80 feet shorter in length, uh, so it's a little bit shorter lengthwise, but uh, a subtle feature about the wall that a lot of people don't realize, at Fenway Park they have Morse code in the wall for the initials of Tom and Gene Yockey who owned the Red Sox for many, many years. So if people look closely at our wall on the scoreboard, you're going to see Morse code for the initials of the owners of the Portland Sea Dogs, Dan and Harriet Burke, and it's just one of those small, subtle features that most people don't even realize is even there. When you're looking, when you're looking at it, it looks close, you know, but uh, you know, the ball gets caught up there a little. It reminds you of playing at Fenway and, you know, it'd be a, be a cool, cool thing to play for the Giants in the major leagues and go to Fenway, play a series there and sort of bring everything full, full circle. Any former Sea Dog that's currently on the 25-man roster of the Red Sox, and we also include DL players as well, gets honored with a jersey up on the stadium. Uh, they're not retired numbers. We're just honoring the players that are on the current 25-man roster of our Major League affiliates. And I think if you look up right now, there's probably 15 or 16 jerseys up there. So more than half the roster has come through Portland. Papelbon, Lester, Clay Buckholtz, Jacoby Ellsbury. But the best guy I've ever seen here was uh, two years ago, Mookie Betts. Looking at the fact that the guy was in low A in 2013, he went to high A, he struggled in low A, he came here in the cold environment, let off, dominated for two straight months, uh, game changing player uh, on the base paths, great base runner, great defender, but also the players were in awe of him, I've never seen players in awe of another player. Swing and a drive, hit the deep left field, Perkins looks up and that ball is into the net above the main monster, a no doubter off the bat of Mookie Betts. Jackie Bradley Jr. is one of the favorite guys to come through here over the years. Uh, you could tell when he was playing at this level, he just had 
that special skill that he was going to be a good everyday Major League Baseball player. And with the Red Sox team right now, it's filled with young talent that's come through Portland. Uh, obviously, Jackie Bradley Jr. is a major part of that. Mookie Betts, Xander Bogarts, the list goes on and on. And so it's a special group of people, and uh, Jackie is you know, a key part of that. His arm was so good that he would try to throw guys out from right center, and sometimes when you do that here at the professional level, guys can advance. It took him about a game or two to, to realize I shouldn't do that. Um, but you could see the power, uh, and now you're seeing it in the big leagues. But just a great approach, uh, willing to work harder than anybody, a great family background, but I think the worth ethic, the guys that come through here that have gotten to big leagues, they want to work. They want to face big league rehabbers. They want to hit early batting practice, take early ground balls. Jackie and, and Mookie were guys that you pay to watch do something else than hit. And, and you can't say that a lot about a baseball player. Production funding for Flying Squirrels Insider is made possible in part by... Smell gas? Act fast. Don't just stand there. Leave the area. Get out. Go where the smell is no longer present and call 911. Making you aware, keeping you safe. We're Richmond's Natural Gas Safety Awareness Program. And by SICOM Technologies. Celebrating 20 years in IT. SICOM is dedicated to helping customers stay on top of the tech wave, whatever comes next, online at SICOMTech.com.